Hello, and welcome to the Research 101 podcast series by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I am Jennifer Garner, outgoing chair of the Academy's Council on Research. This series will provide an overview of the research process and provide information on Academy research opportunities. You can earn one and a half units of continuing professional education by listening to all six podcasts. During this fourth podcast, I will be again uh, interviewing Dr. Christopher Taylor, who will share his advice on analyzing results, or analyzing your data and getting results, <laughs> rather. Uh, so as a reminder, if you didn't listen to the last, uh, to part three, Dr. Taylor is professor of medical dietetics and professor of family medicine at The Ohio State University, where he teaches a course on research design in medical dietetics and has also spent 16 years exploring how lifestyle factors impact obesity and chronic diseases. He also studies personal and cultural factors that impact disease and his two major focus areas include food patterning and the influence of personal factors on lifestyle behavior choice. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for sharing your time and experience with us today, uh, not once, but twice. No problem. So my, my first question for you for this, this part four here is uh, analyzing data from a research project can be one of the most exciting steps of the process because you have your data and you're about to find out kind of what happened or what your data say, but I think it can also be pretty intimidating, especially for a new researcher, someone new to the process. So um, what general advice do you have for approaching this stage, stage of the process? Well, the... Again, the beauty of designing the research study is you come up with the question. The question tells you what it is that you need to do to answer that question. You collect the data that you need to answer that question. And then when it comes time for statistical analysis, um, really the magic is, okay, I want to know difference between two groups and how they changed, well, that pretty much tells me exactly what type of data I'm going to have, exactly who my groups are, what my, so ultimately it tells me exactly what my statistical test is going to be. So it's really allowing the statistic to be driven by the research questions and then using that data, understanding that data and using that data to answer the question. Because if you're looking for relationships, you're going to run a correlation. If you're looking for things that might predict weight loss outcomes, then you're going to be run air aggression. If you're looking at differences in fruit and vegetable intake before and after a program, uh, it's going to be a paired samples t-test. So the design that you're using and the data that you're collecting really then leads you to that statistical test. It's now just making sure that you're collecting data in such a way um, that you're gathering the specific things that you need for your particular outcomes. Mm -hmm. So for, for again, for the novice researcher who may be less familiar with statistics, do you have any, especially in your teaching, do you have any go-to tutorials or resources that you recommend uh, for students? I know that there's, a, whether they're formally a student or a uh, uh, a student uh, who's working full time but really wants to learn more about the research process that they right. could they could access. Mm -hmm. um, there are a handful of research out there resources out there. UCLA Statistics Department has actually developed a very nice description of the different statistical tests and what to use where. Um, actually, in our old oh, chat, ah, pardon me, our JADA issues, there were some articles that had been written by the research committee talking about uh, the different types of statistical tests, um, how you would use that data. Um, and I think as you start to get a little bit more complicated in your statistical designs, I think it's, it's probably wise at that point to kind of understand where your limitations are. Um, if you're going to get too complicated in your designs um, and some of your statistics, if you start to feel like you're getting outside of your comfort zone, this is where I think it becomes um, beneficial for you to be able to link up to uh, any of your programs that are in the area. Um, you have dietetics program with faculty that are doing research. And now it doesn't even have to be local, as you'll have individuals 
throughout the country that are doing work. Um, you can connect with the Research Dietetics Practice Group, uh, Research DPG. There will be researchers that are working on everything from functional foods to um, basic science to food patterns to food service to uh, policy. So there are lots of different partnering uh, individuals out there. Um, one of the things that we have done recently in working with some of our clinical dietitians is for them to just use the information warehouse to look at chart review data. And they looked at it and said, oh, I could never understand how to do this. I could never come up with these. And they captured the information. They said, oh, these are meaningful groups that we can put together. Next thing I know, they're sending me the percentages of people who had an, a visit and the percentage of people who went to their visit or not. So um, thinking about what it is you need to do, what you have, and then just kind of making that methodical step of what information do I have here and how will that help me answer my question. Mm -hmm. One thing that, that you sometimes see in, in the literature or analyses that individuals have done is they talk about accounting for covariates and kind of accounting for these other factors that might be happening in the background or other um, demographic variables, for example. And so you mentioned earlier the importance of understanding what data you have and making sure you have the, the data you need to do the analyses you want. So could you, I think that sometimes can be confusing for people. Could you elaborate on on um, some of those other types of data or other um, outcomes that, or not outcomes, other um, variables that people might collect in order to facilitate their analyses? Right. Um, and that's where I think the systematic process, uh, once again, I know systematic and research kind of go hand in hand, but thinking about what things are happening that you are trying to either measure or facilitate a change. So if you're going to incorporate nutrition intervention and then measure their outcomes, we would want to assess one, the process of how did they actually receive the intervention. So if you're going to offer them four counseling sessions, one of the things we want to measure is the process of them, how many sessions did they go to? And then measuring our outcome as to what we wanted to do to get there. And then what are some of the factors that might be related to um, the variables that you're trying to assess. And you had mentioned uh, covariates. And it's to take that step towards for measuring obesity or diabetes, are there individuals or groups that are more likely to have obesity or diabetes compared to other groups? So race ethnicity might be an important variable to measure. Gender might be an important variable to measure. Um, age uh, will definitely be related to those types. So we'll have to think about what those risk factors might be. And if your groups end up different based on um, one of those risk factors, then that can be accounted for within the statistical design. So then what it does is it compares group A to group B after it really kind of normalizes for what those age differences might be or gender or race ethnicity. And then, as I mentioned, as you start to get more sophisticated in those, it requires just a little bit more um, uh, knowledge of how to make those types of statistical models come out correctly. Um, so that's where I, you will want to then start linking up with someone who has that expertise. Right. So then how might a registered dietitian or a registered dietitian in training who's maybe not a member of an academic community or a new member of an academic community find a statistician or someone with similar skills to help with their data analyses. Yeah, and that's where I think um, one, reaching out to programs that are in your area and identifying those individuals that are doing some work in your particular area. The other nice thing is, is that most universities just about everywhere either in person or online um, access, have a statistical consulting um, department that can be available for hire, uh, depending on various uh, funding models. 
but they're available to say, all right, what's your data? What's your question? What do we need to know? And they can actually be the go-to for the, for the statistical testing so that they can be your mechanism for analyzing the data, helping you understand what you have so that you can be more focused on what the real question is and carrying out the process. Um, and then allowing the the more complicated statistical pieces to be um, run by those that really have the expertise in that area. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm wondering, in addition to working with um, experts in this area, whether it's through a statistical consulting unit or mentors at your university or, or elsewhere, um, there's also a lot of software available. And so. Uh, we have a, a few more minutes left of this part four, and I wonder, could you speak, again, from the perspective of a novice researcher, of certainly you can use Excel for certain things, but then there's a wide variety of other software. So what do you recommend for, for students and others? Yeah, because um, when you're collecting certain types of data, if you're doing questionnaires, even if you're filling them out on on paper, um, because you're in a you're in a low income community, you're in a free clinic, but you're trying to get some some of the information collected. Using some of the online survey tools to build your survey um, as if you were giving it online, you can manually enter the responses that you've got. We've done a test of an app, and we're got 200 responses, but for the fastest tabulation, we're just entering those into the online questionnaire. It'll then give us the percentage of people who liked it. It'll give us the means and things like that. Um, so you'll have those types of online processes. Um, the project that I mentioned with the dietitians in the hospital, they were using Excel to basically get the averages and the percents and the counts. Um, as you start getting into some of the more statistical packages, um, there are certain ones that have a little bit more of an Excel look like SPSS, where SAS is a little bit more of a code-driven system. Um, the one thing you have to be careful with statistical packages is that they, they don't know what kind of data you have. They do what you tell them to do. So it'll allow you to run an average gender. It may not mean anything when you're done. But um, it'll let you do whatever you tell it to do, um, as long as the data is the right type. So, um, but they do have a lot of tutorials that are built in, as well as those that are online that'll walk you right through how to run a t-test, how to set up your data, and, and what those data mean when you get them out on the other end. Right. Certainly, I. I... I've even used some of those uh, YouTube tutorials and such for, for programs like that. One thing I want to clarify, though, you mentioned some online survey programs. And yeah. I'm thinking, like, SurveyMonkey, but are there are there others that are um, better or worse for this type of work? Um, they're all just a little bit different. I mean, you have everything from Google Forms to SurveyMonkey to Qualtrics to um, REDCap that's used by a lot of the clinical translational science centers. You have to, one, kind of understand what the data security side is um, because Google Forms typically is not on that secure server side as far as um, access where you'll have more security with your SurveyMonkey or your um, um, Qualtrics from the IRB's perspective. Um, but there are lots of different ones out there. Um, some of them are free, some of them cost money. Um, but it's really about the level of kind of uh, how complicated do you need it to be or do you just need it to be simple? Um, and that can really kind of drive the types of decisions you might want to make. Yeah, that makes sense. And it sounds like another opportunity to really leverage the, the expertise and advice of any mentors or partners in this work who might have um, more more experience. So, okay. Well, um, thank you so much again, Dr. Taylor, for sharing your expertise and, and wealth of experience in this area. This uh, is the end of, of part four, and we thank you again for being part of this series. You're welcome.